Um, thank you all for joining me and us today. I know it's a it's always a busy time of the semester, but it's a busy time, maybe especially on campus and certainly in the CERT, as I know people are thinking a lot about their action plans right now. So I'm, I'm so glad if you're here to see you live and if you're watching this on a recording, I appreciate you coming back and, and checking in to see what we talked about today. As you can see from the title slide here, um, and Kathy says hi, hey Kathy, um, we're, we're talking, the plan today is to talk a little bit about fair use and how that relates to open educational resources and specifically how this new resource called the Code of Best Practice in Fair Use for OER can be useful. What I thought I would do to sort of get the discussion started is share a little bit of context about the relationship between fair use and OER, give you a quick overview of the code itself, um, and then I'm going to do my level best at the end to leave some time for questions and discussion and what does that mean and how do I think about that and what are next steps look like as well. Um, and if there's a great discussion, that's awesome. And if folks are really itching to get to Friday afternoon and beyond, you won't hurt my feelings. That's totally okay as well. So feel free to drop questions in the chat at any time or to unmute and just ask questions that way as well. Uh, but let's go ahead and, and jump into things. So let's start at the beginning here with why are we talking about this issue in the first place? Why is this important uh, to sort of understand the relationship between fair use and OER? Um, and I'll suggest that one of the reasons I think it's important to talk about fair use in OER is it's something we're all already doing. We just often aren't aware that we're doing it. And that means we're not doing it as well as we could be doing it. So, so the very quick legal overview here is when we make pretty much anything, including an open educational resource, we generally rely on three uh, distinct but related legal provisions. Um, the first is works in the public domain, works that are old enough that they have passed into the public domain, uh, ideas, facts, words and short phrases, the sort of things that are not eligible for copyright protection. Those are things that we include based on their inclusion in the public domain. So that's sort of the first big bucket, as it were, is stuff that copyright doesn't touch in the first place. And so we can say, this is the special theory of relativity, or this is you know, a work of William Shakespeare or whatever it is. The second set of legal provisions that we rely on are works that have been released under an open license. Um, I don't think anybody here has not heard of the Creative Commons. I suspect several people on this call are better situated to explain the Creative Commons than I might be. So I'll just say, if you work in OER land, you're probably familiar with open licenses and the Creative Commons as the legal instrument, instrument we use to make that possible. The third set of things that we rely on though, and this is the area where we often sort of do this without realizing it in some way, is a set of copyright exceptions and limitations that are baked into the positive law itself, including fair use. And these are places where as a matter of policy and history, Congress and the courts have said, enforcing a copyright monopoly would get in the way of copyright's socially valuable purpose. So we're gonna carve out space for teachers and students, for example, to show a movie in the classroom. Section 110, one of the Copyright Act just says flatly, if you're in a nonprofit educational institution and you wanna show a movie, play a song, perform a play, et cetera, go ahead and do it. Don't worry about copyright. Uh, those of us in library land rely on a similar set of exceptions around interlibrary loan and document delivery and that sort of thing. So this set of exceptions come in sort of specific flavors where, where Congress has decided these people doing this stuff is really valuable. But there's also this sort of exceptional exception, and this is what fair use is. It's created by the courts over 100 years ago um, and put into the positive law in the 1976 Copyright Act. And it's Congress's way of saying, and the court's way of saying, there's a lot of stuff that we couldn't have thought of in the 1970s or voices that probably didn't get a fair hearing in the 1970s in Congress but are still doing socially valuable work. So fair use is our catch-all. It's our exceptional exception that's designed to be flexible to support socially valuable uses, particularly and expressly including education, publishing, research, the stuff we do in OER land pretty regularly. So this is, um, I, I went into the library and I pulled one of the highest rated and most used uh, history textbooks out there to demonstrate what these three sort of buckets look like. 
Um, so at the top here, I have the Creative Commons license. Everything in the Open Textbook Library has a Creative Commons license on it. Um, so everything that you look at in the library is an example of, in some sense, reliance on Creative Commons licenses, including this world history textbook. You can also see a couple of examples, though, of, this, of the what I call the first bucket, the public domain bucket. Um, this statue that's featured on the cover, uh, statues and sculptures are eligible for copyright protection, but I suspect that this statue is old enough that it has passed into the public domain, so no permission was needed to use it. And then on the left here, this chronology of sort of very, very early history, eight to six million years ago, 2.6 million years ago and on, there is not copyright protection in that chronology because it's just a statement of facts. This happened and then this happened and then this happened. So whether or not anybody wondered, hmm, I wonder if I have to get permission to do that, copyright law would tell you no, ideas and expression of this, ideas of this sort are not protected by copyright. So the, the two obvious ones, the, the Creative Commons stuff and the public domain stuff, I think everybody knows about. If you want to nerd out about that, I'm happy to, but I'm going to sort of take that as read. The third example, though, um, fair use, and, and similar exceptions is an area that you will sometimes hear people say, oh, we don't rely on fair use in our open educational resources. It's not safe, fair use is scary, I don't think we can do it. And I like this book um, because you don't have to turn any further than word one in chapter one on page one of this well-respected textbook to see a textbook example of fair use. There's a quotation here at the beginning. It starts in 1952 at the age of 77 and goes on from there. You can see the citation at the bottom. Um, quotation is the most common and sort of most well-used example of fair use. To, to do a short quotation like this, you don't have to get copyright permission. And I'd be a little surprised if the authors did get copyright permission for every quote that you see across this textbook. There are a lot of them. They're often you know, six or seven words. I think if you ask the authors, they'd say, oh yeah, you can just do that, right? That's You can just do short quotes and they may or may not make the connection to relying on fair use. But this is one example from hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, in the open textbook library of books that, that are, in fact, relying on all three of these types of legal opportunities, open licenses, public domain works, and copyright exceptions. So I, so I take all this time to tell you this, one, just to demonstrate these three buckets, but also to indicate that most OER and certainly most good OER give themselves the opportunity to rely on all three of those types of use. They say, I'm gonna engage with the existing literature that's openly licensed, I'm going to engage with the existing materials that are not protected by copyright, and I'm going to engage in some sense in reliance on fair use in order to build the best materials possible. The uh, sort of pithy way we've been talking about that on the Code of Best Practice team is to say that OER creation is not a closed book exam, right? If you locked me in a room and you said I couldn't refer to anybody else's work or do anything that I couldn't pull out of my brain, I'd make a pretty bad resource, right? the best creation engages with what has come before and builds on it in different ways. And fair use is, legally speaking, the way you're able to do that. So OER is not a closed book exam. And then these two bullets here, I think, are important as well. Um, fair use is medium neutral. It applies to text and images and music and video and everything else. Um, and fair use is something that we all rely on every day in all of the work that we do. And that's how it's supposed to function. And that's how it's supposed to work. The other side of the coin is if, if somebody were to say, well, now that you've told me that, I guess I'm going to have to scale back my practices a lot. I find fair use too intimidating. So now that you've told me that I'm using it, I'm terrified and I'm going to stop relying on it. There would be real significant costs there as well. Um, as we talk to people in the community, we heard over and over something that I think we, we sort of intuited as well, which is that fair use is an important tool for good pedagogy in every situation, but it's especially important when you're dealing with providing access for students with disabilities, for meeting our mission in terms of making the best materials, um, and for, in particular, sort of centering marginalized students, uh, presenting underrepresented voices, doing the stuff that OER is especially good at particularly relies on fair use. And a decision to step back from or not rely on fair use would do real harm uh, to all of those students that I've talked about, but also to our ability to make the best resources possible and then share them widely with other folks as well. I wanna highlight two specific risks that are sort of related to that. And the first is there's been a lot of writing done on this thing called the 20th century black hole. 
And basically what that means is if you go into, um, these are works available on Europeana, which is like a big repository of materials, but this is also true you know, in, on Amazon and anywhere you can get access to stuff, you will find that things from the 1920s and earlier that are in the public domain are widely available because there are no legal limits on access to those things, right? If you wanna find a copy of Hamlet, it's not too hard to put your hands on a copy of Hamlet. And then stuff from the last 20 years or so are generally accessible because they're actively being marketed and sold and produced and, and shared in different ways. But then in the middle of the 20th century, in this space where commercial publishers are not making things as much available because they're not the new hot thing, but there is also copyright concern about sharing, you have this sort of disappearing middle of the century, the 20th century black hole. And OER are very much set up to be a victim of this if we don't rely on fair use. As we saw with the textbook a moment ago, the old stuff, the statue from you know, thousands of years ago, we know we can use. And the stuff that's created with an open license in the past 30 years or so, we often understand how we can use because Creative Commons is there, but there wasn't a Creative Commons in 1960, right? And many people who created things in the 1960s still might not know about the Creative Commons and certainly might not think to go back and put a CC license on that thing they created 40 years ago. So if we want a way into the 20th century black hole um, that gets us beyond the sort of only the really old stuff or the really recent stuff, uh, fair use is the way that we do that work and make sure not just our history textbooks, but all of our, our resources reflect the full set of stuff that's out there, not just the really new and the really old. The second specific risk I want to highlight here is the risk around representation. Um, the Creative Commons is an awesome enterprise and I'm proud to, to work in that space and everything else. It has a lot of blind spots and limitations. Um, the work on Wikipedia has been, I think, especially uh, noteworthy recently in terms of limited representation and it's a you know overrepresentation among certain groups and underrepresentation among others. But to the extent that we want our OER to be truly uh, representative in terms of age and sex and you know race and everything else, it's imperative that we include fair use in the toolbox so that we can not just grab the stuff that's been openly licensed by the people who use Creative Commons licenses, but the, the lived experiences of all of our people, all of our creators and all of our students in different ways. Um, I, I love this tweet from somebody saying, hey, I'm trying to write about protest in the George Floyd protests. There are no images from any of the A states in Wikimedia Commons. Alabama, Arkansas, Arizona, Alaska are all missing. So if you want to write about protest and include any information about what's happening there, Wikimedia Commons has nothing for you. Um, so you can either say, oh, well, sorry, A states, you don't get to be part of the story here, or you can rely on fair use, which is this well-established, well-understood legal tool that's designed to fill exactly these gaps. So, so that's off of soapbox here in terms of why fair use is important, but I think it's, it's really, really critical for living up to our highest aspirations in the open education community. So that's the why. As I say, I'm going to step off my soapbox now and move into more sort of an explanatory mode um, to talk a little bit about what fair use is specifically and the way the best practices work to support using fair use. So fair use itself, as I said, is a, a what we call an equitable exception, which means it's sort of flexible and it was originally judge made. Um, if you go to the statute, there's this sort of four factor test that if you've ever seen a copyright presentation, you've probably heard before. But since the early 1990s, courts have really taken the big and, and sometimes intimidating body of fair use law and synthesized it into this core question about whether a use is transformative or not. And this transformation question is, are you doing something new or different with the material? Are you making a new meaning or message? Are you recontextualizing something? In other words, are you bringing your own creativity to bear or are you just free writing off of somebody else's work? And if you're doing something new that demonstrates your own creativity, a court is likely to call that transformative. And then if you're using the appropriate amount of somebody else's work to do that transformative stuff, fair use is generally gonna protect the, the stuff that you're doing. Um, as it says here, if the answer is yes to both, then courts are going to say it's transformative, and then you are unlikely to run into the sort of uh, pocketbook market harm questions that courts sometimes ask as well. Um, this, as I say, goes back to 1994 and the uh, Campbell versus A.Q. Froze case. It was reaffirmed this spring by the U.S. Supreme Court in the Google versus Oracle case in some of the more sort of stunningly uh, 
enthusiastic and emphatic language. The court really went out of its way to say transformation is really critical and transformation is critical because it's a tool to make sure fair use lives up to its society serving functions. So fair use is not as complicated if you, if you understand transformation and I'm gonna argue that, that it's uh, pretty easy to understand in the context of our own professional practices because that's what we're experts in. Um, then you can know that it's also a very reliable document as well. So that's what fair use is. The way fair use is often operationalized is through these sets of codes of best practice. So basically for the past 16 to 17 years or so, um, the code team has identified communities that are struggling with fair use or that are feeling intimidated by fair use. Uh, the first community was, was the community of documentary filmmakers who were having trouble getting errors and emissions insurance and, and spent some time with them. In 2011 and 12, they worked with my community of academic librarians and created a code of best practice for academic and research libraries. That code was focused on electronic course reserves and archiving online materials and the big questions in, in that community. But codes in general, you engage with the community, you identify what the big tension points are, and then you ask the question, what does responsible practice look like in this space? What would a good documentary filmmaker? What would a good academic librarian, what would a good open educator do in this context? Because in those moments where we rely on our professional expertise to live out our professional values, that's where the doctrine of transformativeness tends to loom the largest and fair use is of most use in a sense. So with this code in particular, we focused on this idea of what we called inserts which is sort of a catch-all term for I'm building an OER and I need to bring something into this document. It could be a quote, it could be a picture, it could be a video, it could be a song. We tried to capture all those things that you bring in under the term of inserts. So as I talk about inserts here and as the code describes inserts, that's what they mean is third-party material that's gonna improve the pedagogical value of the open educational resource. There are lots of codes of best practice for different communities, and they are not exclusive to one another. In fact, they work very nicely in harmony. And the example that I'll share here is the code of best practice for fair use doesn't talk about classroom instruction. It really is focused on creating, building, and publishing open resources. But the code of best practice and fair use for academic and research libraries does have some pretty important stuff to say about course reserves, about classroom instruction and that sort of thing as well. So when I'm talking to an educator about making their work more open and impactful, I bring both of those codes to bear. I say, when you're designing your materials, let's look at the code of best practice and fair use for OER. When you're designing your practices and when you're working with the library to share stuff with students ahead of time, that's when we turn to the code of fair use for academic and research libraries. So these are all great resources to use and they work especially well in harmony and concert with one another as well. We're gonna spend the next little bit focused on the code of best practice and fair use. Uh, Beth, I see a hand up. So please ask your question here or in chat, wherever you're most comfortable. Um. Well, do I understand you correctly, Ben? Oh, can you hear me okay? I can, yeah, thanks for checking. Yeah, okay. So you're saying that when faculty are, and I'm sorry, I can't turn my camera on, but um, when faculty are like writing or preparing presentations or something like that, uh, you'd recommend the code for fair use in OER. Whereas when they're thinking about teaching, then look for the one in academic and research libraries. Uh, that one and for the sort of working with the libraries on course reserves and that sort of thing as well. If they were a media literacy educator, I'd also point them to the code of best practice and fair use for media literacy education. Um, if they were making online videos, I go to online video, but you're exactly right that, that this idea that you can bring them together and say, I need to do four things. This code addresses two, this other code addresses this one and so forth. Thank you. Yes, great question. Thank you. Other questions while we've gotten me to pause and take a breath? If not, I'll, I'll um, head on. So, so that's what the codes are as a thing. Um, the other thing I wanna say about the code at the outset is that we are aware that there is a certain amount of um, uncertainty around how fair use fits in with open education. So we have really doubled down on making this a conservative mainstream middle of the road document. 
Um, I have heard the question, so is this some sort of radical, you know, radicalizing document that's trying to push people outside of their comfort zones and do stuff that maybe they can get away with? And the answer to that is no, this is the most sort of mainstream center of the map version that you can imagine. If, if the map is the stuff an educator can do, we are like right in the middle of the map in that way. In fact, um, so I mentioned here, the, these are broadly held, held views. We heard from many people in the OER community and they were vetted by this panel of independent copyright experts. Uh, I'll show you the panel on the next slide. There are some, some really amazing people here. To a person, what they said was, you could probably do a little more here. Right, what you say they can do this much. In fact, as, as a legal expert, they could do that plus a little bit more. And we said, we know this, this sounds very mainstream and middle of the road. It's important to us that there be absolutely no question that this is safe ground, that at no point go, wow, that's a little risky, or that that's really asking me to, to be brave in some sense. This is the this is the safe, mainstream, easy version of this stuff. Um, this panel of, extra, of external reviewers did a great job of helping us think through the legal stuff, the, the how do we communicate this information stuff, but the one thing they all said was, you, you have described the safest of the safe ground here. You need to communicate to folks that there is more space to spread their wings as well. Um, and so I say that to, to point to these famous and awesome people, uh, but also to say what you see in the code is you can definitely do that. There is space beyond what we say in the code that is also relatively safe, but you should know if you're relying on the code explicitly, you are on the, the sturdiest, safest place you could possibly be. So that's that's how we made the code is a series of interviews with open education folks. We did a, a bunch of one-on-one -on -one interviews and then a ton, a ton of focus groups as well. Um, and then we created a document. It was vetted by the panel of external reviewers and then we released it. So without further ado, let's look at what the code actually says, how it's written itself. The heart of the code is a set of four principles. And these basically were uh, recurring situations that open educators told us were important to them and felt like good, appropriate pedagogical things to be doing. They, they, whether, you know, where, however they felt about fair use, they said a good educator does these things. The best education and pedagogy happens when these activities are happening. So what we do is we describe that use case. Educators said it was important to do this thing. Then we turn that into sort of a one sentence statement of principle. It is permissible under fair use to include inserts as objects of critique. That's the first one I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Um, and then we said, here are a set of considerations. When you're doing that, think about this thing and this thing and this thing. Think about providing proper attribution. Think about um, selecting the amount necessary for your purpose and not using too much or too little. A set of considerations as you apply that simple statement of principle. And then the last thing we did is we included a set of hard cases as sort of an outer limit and a reminder that this isn't just to get out of jail free card. This isn't a magic wand where you can go like fair use and then do whatever you want. There are instances where if you're starting to apply this principle in this context, it's not a no, but it's a look a little closer. Really be sure about your transformative purpose here. So each of the four principles I'm going to mention basically follow this structure, use case, statement, considerations, hard cases. So the first principle, um, I think statistically was the thing we heard most often from educators. And the good news is it's also the easiest possible fair use question you could possibly ask. I want to include an insert as an object of critique or commentary. Is that okay? Is that permitted by fair use? The answer is absolutely yes. So we've got this poem from E.E. E. Cummings here. If you were writing a textbook on uh, the critique and analysis of poetics and poetic devices, and you said, I want to have students look at an actual poem, and then in the textbook itself, I'm going to break it down and say, these are the techniques being used here. This is the way this is effective. These are the ways that it's been less effective, sort of bringing this outside object into the scope of the critique and analysis that a textbook often does and often is preparing students to do. Um, that's the sort of thing fair use is designed to support. And indeed, that's the sort of thing that the statute specifically calls out. Critique and commentary is an example that the statute says, fair use is for this sort of thing, you know, like critique and commentary. So th that's the well, first. 
Yes. Excuse me, Will. I, Anastasia put in the chat, are we supposed to be seeing a different screen than the panel of external reviewers? Yes, you are. Are you not seeing the using? I'll sit back and forth. I am still seeing the external reviewers. And I think Anastasia is as well. Huh. So maybe yes. Well, let me stop share and start share again. Sorry, we're having all these technical issues. There we go. Okay. Thank you for bearing with me. Can anybody hear me and potentially see my screen? Yes. Yay. Hooray. Thank you all. Sorry for the for the Friday afternoon confusion here. Um, so here is that poem that I was mentioning a minute ago and the objects of criticism and commentary conversation we were just having. That's the first principle. And as I say, that's the easy one. Um, there, this is both an easy pedagogical case, critique and commentary is sort of what we do, and it's a really easy uh, legal case and fair use case. The second example is almost as easy. It has to do not with bringing an insert in in order to comment on it, but instead with bringing an insert in, an object in, in order to use it for the purpose of illustration. So you're not like critiquing the technique being used. You're saying, I'm describing a phenomenon or a principle, and this is a great illustration of that. So the example that I'm hoping you can see here is a set of robots from about 50 years apart in movies, uh, included not to describe how well or poorly the costumes are made, but to, but to illustrate Hollywood has had this sort of ongoing sense of what a robot might look like. Here are two famous examples of that. And again, this is a, a use that's explicitly described in the statute around fair use as the sort of thing fair use is supposed to support. And this is one of the main things that educators told us were really important in terms of using inserts. It's helpful when I'm describing a phenomenon to include an illustration. So the second principle walks through that purpose of bringing in four purposes of illustration. The third principle is, I think, a really, really important and, and was articulated a lot by the educators we talked to in particular communities especially, but I think generally as well. And this is the idea that we're not necessarily bringing, you know, something in in order to critique the technique of it. We're bringing it in in order to make the lessons being learned more uh, relevant and representative of the actual world as it exists. So this example is one that we heard explicitly. A foreign language educator said, I can write an unlimited number of stilted, ridiculous, you know, je m'appelle Will. Uh, right? I can make up sentences in French for my French one students to learn, but at some point they need to read the real books and watch the real shows and actually see how my, this language is used by actual human beings in the real world. Um, so, so an educator bringing in a portion of or a poster of or maybe even an entire um, episode of a Brazilian telenovela, not to critique the, the dramatic performances or whatever, or even to illustrate trends in telenovelas, but to say, as you learn to speak the language, this is how it's actually spoken colloquially in the real world. So that third principle of bringing in content as learning resource materials because they are irreplaceable as examples of the way it's actually done, not just the sort of stilted made up textbook version of it. That's the third principle that's articulated. Again, that's, that's very clear fair use and has, at least from what we heard, a lot, a lot of value in terms of pedagogy for the open educators that we spoke with. The fourth principle is a little different and it, it requires a little more nuance, but I think it is pretty useful. Um, the way we often talk about this one is as the don't reinvent the wheel principle. Um, the first question a lot of folks in open education get is, I, there are two really good commercial textbooks out there. Can't I just take chapters from those? And of course our sad answer is always, no, you can't. If there's no open license, you can't just do that 5R stuff that we've talked about. But there is sort of a subset of that category, which is there's a really, really good book from 1950. It's out of print now. It's not in commercial use in any real way. So there's no market here. Um, and I would never assign the book itself because it has some really 1950s attitudes about nuclear technology or about, you know, the way men and women interact with each other or whatever it is, right? The book itself is both commercially unavailable and pedagogically pretty problematic in a lot of ways, but there are some pieces of it that would be really useful to incorporate into my new OER. So the example I've include he included here is this, this verb chart, right? That that has not changed much in the ensuing 60 years, 60, 70 years or so, 
Um, so taking a verb chart from an out of print textbook and saying the textbook itself doesn't have an open license, but there is no market harm here whatsoever, right? Nobody is trying to sell copies of that textbook. Nobody's trying to get access to that textbook. The publisher probably wishes nobody even knew about that textbook anymore, but there are pieces that you can pull from the wreckage of that old textbook to bring into your new textbook. Um, so the verb chart is a nice example. Folks also asked about things like, I really like the way they describe this phenomenon. There's a, there's a two paragraph overview of an important foundational concept in the field or the way, the way they have structured and described the different elements of the textbook. Chapter one is this, chapter two is that um, in a deep and creative way. That's the sort of thing you can bring in uh, in a way that we describe as repurposing that pedagogical content from existing but out of commerce educational materials. And that out of commerce is really, really important. Um, and the, the considerations and hard cases dig into that out of commerce idea pretty significantly. So those are the four principles, commentary and critique, illustration, stuff from the real world, and then the, the don't reinvent the wheel when you don't have to stuff. Those are sort of the four principles that are articulated in the code. There is more than just those four principles in the code, though, and I want to gesture towards that other stuff quickly as well, and then make sure that we do have some time to, to answer your questions and talk about your action plans and your work as well. So quickly, as we talk about the core values throughout the code, the things that we heard repeatedly from educators and that we wanted to make sure are reflected in the code, um, copyright law has nothing to say about attribution, but every single educator we talked to said attribution was important. Unsurprisingly, attribution is a value that I think we all sort of understand and value. The other thing that we heard a lot that, again, the law doesn't require, but, but we felt it was important to reflect, was that a clear marking of fair use inclusions was really, really critical. That telling downstream users especially, this book is openly licensed, but you should know there's some stuff in here that is not openly licensed, that's being used in reliance on fair use. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that principle works in a minute. The other core values that we heard were the importance of fair use as a tool for equity and empowered practice. Um, just because fair use says you are legally permitted to do something doesn't mean that you should do that thing. The intention for the code is not to command that you rely on fair use in all cases. It's to say, we wanna take your legal concern out of the way so you can properly center what's the ethical thing to do? What's the inclusive and invitational thing to do here? What's the best pedagogical practice here given the wide variety of options that the law provides me? So continuing to talk about fair use as a tool for centering the really important stuff rather than as an end into itself is something that, that I think is really, really important to say. Something else that we heard a lot and we had a lot of conversations about was this question about fair use as a tool for accessibility, particularly as it relates to linking out. Something that we heard from a few educators was, I don't really think I need fair use. I'm just gonna link out to stuff, right? If I really want students to see that video, I don't have to incorporate the video in that or the image or whatever. I'll just give them a link out into the, you know, into the wild and, and then they can follow that link and see the resource in a different place. Um, the problems with that uh, may or may not have been obvious a year ago, but having spent a year teaching online, the problems with that, to me at least, seemed pretty self-evident right away. Um, not everybody lives in a place where they have hot and cold flowing internet. And so directing them out to YouTube, you know, over and over in their textbook has a certain initial set of problems there. Um, directing students out to links also has the broken link problem, right? The New York Times has been doing some great reporting on the link rot that's, that's really starting to affect a lot of really important documents, you know, Supreme Court opinions that link out to stuff with broken links and that sort of thing, right? So, so a textbook that relies on links is going to be vulnerable to that as well. Um, sites like YouTube also have weird and often gross terms of use that we might not want to force our students to engage with. Um, they often include you know, the commercial before that video you want your students to see might be sharing information that, that feels uncomfortable or problematic or just isn't what you're, you want your students to be seeing. Um, I, I won't say that students might also be enticed by the recommended videos that might be more interesting than the next chapter of a textbook, but I think that's potentially a concern as well. But most of all, external links that direct students to another source take the burden of assuring accessibility off of the creator's back and put it on the student's back instead. It's, it's a way of saying, 
I hope this thing that's being linked to is accessible, but if there's a problem, you're going to have to reach out to that video creator or that whomever and deal with that as well. So, so something that we felt going in, thanks Beth, um, something that we felt going in and we were, we were not surprised to hear from a bunch of educators is the illusion of linking out as, a, as an easy solution to all of these problems is just that. It's an illusion and it's an illusion that has um, huge problems for all educators and disproportionately huge problems for our underrepresented, marginalized uh, students and those especially who have needs around accessibility. So that, that core value of fair use as a way to get us to do something better than just say, here's a link to YouTube, you figure it out. That felt really important to a lot of the people that we spoke with. So let's say a little bit more about marking instances of fair use, because I think that gets to one of the, the major points of conversation that we kept coming back to, which is one of the things I'm excited about, and a lot of people are excited about around OER, is that sort of 5R stuff. I hope that this is the first iteration and hundreds of other educators take my stuff and make it better or make it more localized or make it more inclusive or representative or right. The, the idea that downstream use is an important value in open education is something that, that I feel very strongly in my heart for sure. Um, if I am taking an existing resource that has an open license on it and remixing it, it's really important that I understand what parts of that are actually openly licensed and what parts of that are not openly licensed as well. So everybody was absolutely clear that there needed to be some way to say, this book is CC by, except for X, Y, and Z, which are used in reliance on fair use. Now, certainly that the fact that everything is not covered by fair use, I mean, that everything is not covered by an open license is something we've thought about for a while, right? I pointed to the public domain stuff in that textbook a little while back. That's another case where the, the original creator had to do an analysis and say, I do think this sculptural work is in the public domain. I've done that research and I'm confident about it. And then a downstream user will have to either take at their word that person's analysis or go back and check their work and do their own analysis. And when we do remix, those issues become especially important. Um, the two things to say about that is if I am taking an existing open educational resource that looks like a textbook and remixing it to create another open educational resource that looks like a textbook, my fair use case is gonna look really, 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 really similar to the fair use case from the upstream original resource. So I can take a lot of comfort in that as well. Um, and in, in a lot of cases, I can presume that to be valid. This is the example I have here. This is a great college textbook on introduction to chemistry. I'm gonna reframe it so it applies to high school students. Well, it's still the same sort of transformative purpose I'm using it for critique and commentary in an open educational resource so I can rely on the existing fair use analysis. Where I am truly transforming something in a, in a more fundamental way, um, I need to go back and open up my copy of the code and say, okay, how does fair use look in this context as well? So I think that's, that's something to be very aware of, but also to be reassured by the fact that one fair use analysis for non-commercial OER critique and commentary, for example, is going to apply downstream to subsequent non-commercial uses in an open educational resource in the same way. So it's important to mark and it's important to understand what it means to mark something. Everybody agreed on that. What nobody agreed on though was how to mark fair use inclusions. Everybody had a different idea or a different way to talk about how to indicate that some materials are used in reliance on fair use rather than under an open license. So again, I've gone back to this example of the textbook to show you, um, this is what they say here. You can see in the middle, um, the image disclaimer here. They say all images and figures in this book are believed to be after reasonable investigation, either public domain or to carry a compatible Creative Commons license. And it goes on from there. So they, they have elided the fact, probably not intentionally that they're relying on fair use, even though as we saw a few slides ago, they are. If they wanted to be more specific and mark instances of fair use in this textbook, if they said, yeah, this marking thing is important, I recognize that there is some fair use going on here. We heard sort of three potential ways to mark fair use inclusions. The first is a direct marking. This image is included under fair use as described in the Code of Best Practice and Fair Use. You may have noticed I did that in our slides here. You can see, Verb conjugation chart is included on the basis of fair use. That's a direct marking. Wherever there is a thing that the open license doesn't apply to, 
we're going to tell you that at the site of the thing itself. That's one way to do it. And when you're dealing with something like a large image, that might be the best way to do it. Educators might say it feels important every time there's an image or a chart or something that looks discrete in that way. I want to mark it at the source. A question we got from people, though, is my book is filled with short quotations. Do I really need to put a fair use disclaimer every time quotation marks show up in my textbook? And the answer, of course, is no, that would be ridiculous. Um, there is a disciplinary understanding that when you see the, the rabbit ears, the quotation mark, that's not something you said, that's something somebody else said. There's sort of a, a cultural marking there. So the way folks talked about marking in that context is it would basically be just to add a sentence to this image disclaimer here that says, throughout this book, items are included in reliance on fair use as described in the code of best practice. Um, and just to say, I'm not going to mark it every time you see it, but every time you see a quote, you should know, ta-da, fair use is happening there. Or all images are included in reliance on fair use, not to mark it at the site of the specific insert, but to say at the beginning of the book, in the same place we include our, our Creative Commons license, all this stuff is openly licensed except for X, Y, and Z, as they've done here as well with the public domain stuff. The third option that people talked about is some sort of hybrid version of that, is to say, I'm gonna have a general statement at the beginning just to say fair use is a thing, know that, and then in those moments where it seems especially critical, we'll also add a specific license. Um, I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do that, and I think the most appropriate way is gonna vary tremendously from discipline to discipline and resource to resource, but however you do it, everybody agreed it was important that you do it. I'll very Quickly, because I know we're coming up on 10 till here, um, say there, there are also a set of appendices that have a lot of really good information about what we found in those interviews I've talked about, uh, some nice backgrounders on fair use and copyright exceptions in the US. We also spend a lot of time thinking and talking about cross-border use of open educational resources, right? Another potential that's really important for OER is the ability to say, I made this thing in the States and now it's being used in Canada and now they're using it over in Spain and now it's going to Italy and on and on and on from there. Um, so we included Karis Craig, who is a Canadian copyright expert. She wrote a section specifically explaining the ways that US fair use and Canadian fair dealing really do heavily overlap and basically said, this is why you can essentially apply this code of best practice as a Canadian educator with a tremendous amount of confidence as well. Um, and then we also gestured towards other nations and the, the sort of ongoing work of harmonizing copyright exceptions to support open practices. So the appendices are, are a good read and useful stuff as well. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we got some nice news from IMLS that we've got some funding to support the creation of resources in reliance on the code. So we're currently um, identifying partners who are either looking to create a new resource, right? I always wanted to do the, the best OER on film criticism, but because I didn't feel empowered to include any clips from films, it felt impossible. Well, good news, we've got some money and we've got some legal expertise to help you build that film criticism OER. Um, so creation of new is the first thing we're funding. The second thing we're funding is updating of old stuff, right? This is a really, really valuable and heavily used open educational resource. Every single person in this book is a white person, and that bums me out. I'd like to go back in and make this a better and more representative book by updating the images that are used. That felt really challenging because of the limitations of what I could find that was CC licensed. We're here to help with that sort of project as well. So if you are thinking about that sort of project now or later, reach out to us. We're really excited to support and we have some funds from IMLS to support that work. So that is most of what I wanted to say in terms of introducing the code. I'm gonna quickly gesture towards three areas that I think you might bring the code into the work that you're thinking hard about right now in your action plans and going on. And then I would love to hear from you all if there are uh, questions you have, opportunities you see, just stuff you wanna talk about. I'm happy to chat. And I know we lost a few minutes due to technical issues. So you certainly don't have to stay any longer, but I am happy to hang a bit longer if anybody does have those questions. So quickly, um, I think there are opportunities to use the code to update your practices. A lot of those action plans talk about the training we offer to our faculty members. What is OER? How do I use OER? And that sort of thing. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities to incorporate the code in the way we talk about 
the opportunities that faculty have and authors have to create open educational resource. So as a, as a how does copyright work document, I think the code might be useful. And as a how do I explain the copyright stuff related to OER to my partners on campus, I think the code has a lot of use there as well. The second area that I have seen in a lot of action plans that I think the code can help you with is creating new OER. As you start to build up your own uh, open educational resources that you are creating yourself or supporting as other people create, think about opportunities to use the codes to do what I just described a second ago, to say, this can be a better, pedagogically stronger document. This can be a more interesting and enriching document. This can be a document that means more to the students who are engaging with it, either because the examples are more resonant or because the, the representation in there is, is more accurate to the people who are actually doing the teaching and learning. So incorporating the code into your publishing is the second thing I think the code might be useful for. And then, and then the third thing to say is I think one of the great benefits of the certificate program is it gives you the opportunity to uh, talk to your administrators, to your higher ups and say, this is how things ought to be done. And the, toad, the code gives a really nice tool to communicate shared expectations up the chain to your boss and your boss's boss and on the way up there as well. Um, so if there's a project that you're excited about and a faculty author is excited about, but your campus administration feels hesitant about, or your office of general counsel is saying, no, that's not permitted, the code can be a tool to help start those conversations as well. Um, we were explicit about including Steve McDonald, who is sort of the, the head honcho of the um, NACUA is the Offices of General Counsel Professional Association. He is one of the leading copyright experts in that community. So if your counsel's office says, I don't know about this weird code of best practice thing, you tell him Steve McDonald says it's okay. And that should, that should mean something to them. So those are the three areas I wanted to point to. And now I'd really like to shut up and give my voice a break and see what questions you have. What did I say too fast? What did I say that was confusing or exciting or, or that you wanna know more about? I see a hand raised, please go ahead. Me well, it's me again. Um, so um, I, the reason I, part of why I asked you about using the, the different codes in different ways is because I have a faculty member who's asked me, he's written a monograph and he really um, want, would like to publish it open uh, access and he wants to include images. And so now I'm wondering, should I just send the code of best practices to him? Because this is, Publishing is not an area of my expertise. I'm much more comfortable helping them find stuff for teaching and stuff. I think that's a great way to start, absolutely, is to say there's this new resource. It sounds like it might be relevant to your work. Um, to the extent that you want to sort of engage in that relationship, you could also say, let's read it together or let's talk about it together, that sort of thing. But, but to the extent that you are super overburdened and busy, it's totally fine to say, the answer to your question lies in this document here. Read it and be well in the world, right? Um, I think that's a totally legit way to respond as well. Yeah. And as I say, if, if there is a really good project here, put us in touch and then he can have the benefit of a bunch of lawyers getting all in his business and helping him out with stuff. Oh, think about that. Great. I'm going to stop share here so I can drop a couple things in the chat as we're, as we're chatting. So other questions, comments, or concerns? There is that link I mentioned a moment ago as well. I had a quick question, Will. Yeah, please. Um, I'm just curious if there's a little more risk if you're using, I mean, you, you showed an example of educational material that does that isn't really marketable anymore, but if you are using educational material that is marketable, um, to create other educational material that's open, is there a higher risk uh, factor there? Dramatically, yes. No, that they, when people say, well, what's the edge case? What can't you do? The, the easy answer is always, you can't take an existing in-commerce textbook and use it in a new textbook because that's not transformative, right? If, if the core of our analysis is you're taking something and you're using it in a new way, 
using a textbook for a textbook is not using it in a new way, right? Now you could imagine somebody teaching, you know, getting their doctorate in education, use it, pulling 10 textbooks and saying textbooks in the 1960s did these weird things. And in the 1970s, right? You could imagine using a textbook as an object of analysis in that way. But unless you're doing that sort of transformative, transformative critique of the textbook or illustration of trends in textbook creation generally, if you're truly saying, I want to help you understand chemistry, so here's a really nice example from this in-commerce chemistry textbook, that's, that's the sort of thing that probably it would be unlikely to be permitted under fair use. Really good question. Thank you. Thanks.